COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, the climate crisis, the migrant crisis, facial recognition, poverty, terrorism, conflict, political and economic nationalism. Just some of the challenges our world is facing right now. Social science is central to addressing these challenges. But what is it and how does it help? Social science is quite simply the science of society. The study of the way people behave and interact. And the influence that has on the world. As social scientists, we hold a mirror up to society. And hold decision makers to account. We analyze the beliefs, the systems and the institutions on which society is built. We challenge the accepted way of doing things. And provide ideas for change. For progression. How can we stop a conflict turning into a war? How do we define and uphold the rights of sex workers? What determines how people vote in an election? What trends lead to mass unemployment? And what drives domestic violence? We provide the evidence required for governments, parliaments, charities, NGOs, think tanks, and businesses to change the world for the better. When an asylum seeker arrives, for example, in the UK and makes a claim, very often they don't have the documentation, they don't have their passports, they can't show the route that they've come in. And so the government needs, the immigration authorities need a way to verify the story. Very often, thousands of cases per year, what they do is they look at the way the person speaks to see is the language that the person uses is consistent with the story that they tell about where they come from. There are a lot of problems that governments really are not aware of. One of them is that people talk in many very different ways. Another problem is that people's language changes. So if somebody originates from Syria, spends some years in a refugee camp in Jordan and eventually arrives in the UK, they may have been away from their own village for many years. So there is a kind of an expiry date on language as a passport. So our research group has made the case that all of these kinds of things, the situation, the way in which the analysis is done, um, the qualifications and expertise of the people doing these analyses, that they all need to conform to certain standards. My colleagues and I have contributed to a set of guidelines that were drawn up that um, the linguistic community said this is, this is a minimum standard that these kinds of analyses should conform to. And we also do concrete um, analyses of individual cases. So the lawyer of an asylum seeker comes to us, says this person's claim has been dismissed based on their language analysis. And then we look at these analyses and say, well, in this case here, the analyst may be at fault. Here there is um, a flawed way of approaching the data. Here there are things in the biography that weren't taken into account and so on. And so in, in, in that way, we've actually managed to overturn, to help overturn quite a few decisions that we think were wrong in the first place. So in 2014, the government introduced a policy, which is the universal infant free school meal policy. And that entails delivering a free meal to all the children in reception year one and year two in primary school, as opposed to just those on free meals previously. And the aim of the government was to boost learning and also to reduce children's body weight. Now, the government is spending £400 per year per child on this uh, policy, so we need to know whether it works. So for the body weight outcomes, we performed statistical analysis based on data collected in schools. So reception children are visited every year and their height and weight is measured. And we use those data and we compared the children getting the free meals with previous groups of children who hadn't had the free meals. And we found that those getting the meals were having a lower BMI at the end of the year and they also had lower rates of obesity. So the policy seemed to have worked in that area. So obviously obesity um, amongst children is a huge debate in the UK and also the free meals have been quite um, intensely discussed with COVID and especially uh, the provision over the summer months. The footballer Marcus Rushford had this initiative for the summer food um, fund. 
So our research really came at the right time for that. It's been picked up quite a lot. Um, we went to the cabinet office to discuss our results and they made the chief medical officer aware of them. We also were invited to speak to the Jamie Oliver campaign, which is called Bite Back 2030. That's an obesity campaign as well. And the BBC cited our research around that discussion of whether, whether providing free meals over the summer holidays for, for eligible children. So it's still early days, but we feel it's a very live discussion. There might be discussions further down the line whether to extend free meals to everyone in primary school or, on the other hand, to scrap them all together if we have a financial squeeze. So we feel that our research has come at the right time to feed into this discussion. I think um, this type of research is really important to see whether the money spent by government is, is delivering um, value for money. And it's much easier to scrap benefits to children and, and anybody for that matter if you, um, if you cannot point at the evidence. So the evidence is there to, to probe what works, what doesn't work, but also to support the things that do work and that we do need to help children attain better body weight in our case. So technology moves pretty fast, as does the speed in which it comes into our lives. However, our understanding of what this means, what the impact is on our rights, on fairness, on citizenship, has started to emerge much more slowly. So we've been trying to really look at these questions and think through problems of how we govern and regulate technology and make sure it fulfills its potential without inflicting unnecessary harm on people. My main focus has been on surveillance technologies. So we're seeing new technologies with huge capability being used by the police and law enforcement without really starting to think through how that might affect the, the population. So what I've tried to do is try and look at these technologies in operation. One piece of work that I did focused on the police uses of facial recognition technology where we looked at all different aspects of this from the legal documentation authorising its use right through to the sharp end of what actually happens in the, the surveillance control room. First of all, we found that the existing legal basis for these technologies is, is limited and we argue insufficient. We also found several other things as well. So for example, when police officers are using technology in order to help their decisions, where does accountability lie? Where does police discretion lie? How how do the police formulate suspicions on people if part of that process is governed by a computer? Ally facial recognition research has been picked up locally in terms of how local and regional police forces use the technology to nationally in terms of national guidance. We've worked quite closely with European Union agencies and parts of the UN on how this technology should be regulated. The only legal case in the world that has looked at the legal basis for facial recognition has said it was insufficient. So we had a role in those proceedings. We submitted part of what is known as an amicus curiae, which roughly equates to an expert witness kind of testimony, where we used our research findings to inform the court of how this technology is used in, in practice, and we also informed them of our legal analysis of the sufficiency of the legal basis for using this technology. We wanted to know if there is a relationship between adolescent mental health and their social media use. We looked at data from Understanding Society, which is a large longitudinal household panel, which asks questions of the same individuals within households, including young people, every year. Some of those questions ask about young people's social media use as well as their well-being. And so we were able to look at associations between those two amongst that group. What we found is that um, more chatting on social media was um, associated with poor levels of mental health amongst girls, but there was not really an association amongst boys. So our research has been um, submitted to a couple of parliamentary select committees um, and also has been cited in reports, for example, um, a recent one by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, and I think it's just part of a larger evidence base that we need to inform policymakers and parents and teachers um, about how to engage in speaking with young people about their social media and digital technology use.
And we all know from our own lives that we think we behave a certain way, but there might be other things that actually influence us into making our choices. And we don't really know that um, unless we have social science research. Um, and it's also based on groups of people. So we think, okay, I, I behave this way, you behave that way, but what we're looking at is groups of people. And one of the reasons why we do that is because policy is made for um, populations for um, countries um, and not for, while it affects individuals, it's not you have a certain policy and I have a certain policy. We all live under the same one. And that's why social science research is important. So what we did was to identify the long run or lifetime benefits of childhood intervention programs. We looked at a program for newborns that was implemented in 1931 in Sweden. We created longitudinal data that tracked people from birth to death, and we got information at the individual level on school performance and labor market um, outcomes, including employment and earnings. So what we found is that this really simple, scalable, low-cost intervention that was basically a package of information and support for mothers of newborns led to a series of improvements over the lifetime of individuals exposed to the intervention. So all of the following improved. School performance, higher educational attainment, employment in skilled occupations and earnings, and even lower rates of chronic disease and higher life expectancy. This research has already um, informed practitioners like nurses and midwives in Sweden. And we've been in touch with the National Board of Health and hope to advise them on their redrafting of child health policy in the coming year. So the main issue I address in my research is, is how can people both individually and together actually shape their everyday lives? I noticed that people really didn't have a lot of opportunities and a lot of skills to not just get a better job or maybe lose some weight, but to actually make serious decisions about what their community is gonna look like, what are the power structures in their community, and what type of society they want. So I've developed a range of democracy technologies or liberation technologies, and this has resulted in a project that we've done in Belfast um, with a community democracy toolkit called Shared Futures. It has three components. Uh, the first is an augmented reality map that you can download of your area on your phone. And what this is very cool about is that it has a present map, so it's like almost like a Google map, right, that you can comment on, like Facebook, and have people also comment back. So you can say, oh, I wish this bus stop was over here. But what we also have done is we worked with young people in these communities to develop what would be amazing in 15 years? And we helped by doing that to help them understand some really cutting edge things such as what would a post-capitalist society look like? What would a different type of society where people don't have to work look like? What would a society look like in which you could have any types of jobs in which you wanted or in which you can use 3D printing to fabricate things? And what we did was we turned that into its own map and then community members can then comment on like, oh, this is such a great idea. I think what was also interesting is that we developed a really innovative community website around this. So we want to increase communication between communities and between individuals. We want to increase the ability for them to directly consult on the issues that affect their lives. So creating ways that we're not just interested in them having the government do things for them, but actually finding ways in which they can start their own cooperatives or work their own businesses so that they can create a community that isn't just about, you know, making them slightly more profitable or making sure that they regenerate in traditional ways, but actually that they literally collaboratively own together and that they are building resources together in order for its continual improvement and their own individual empowerment. Some of my work is on political protest, um, and the question I, um, I ask there um, is how um, people make something together when they come together in the streets and in the squares, um, and when they are attuned to one another in the way um, protesters often are. A common bias that cuts across 
um, the social sciences, um, the wider um, public opinion, even the political field, um, is that um, crowds coming to, together in the streets and in the squares are regarded um, as um, a very dangerous creature, um, almost like something monstrous and irrational or that is going to at any point erupt in some um, erratic and destructive act. Um, and this is um, where um, I like to um, look at them or to ask how they can be creative and what forms of creativity are proper to people coming together. Um, a lot of this creativity has to do with um, making political symbols. Um, and these symbols can then be um, enchained or incorporated in a process of mourning when um, traumas um, that belong to other historical times um, and that are stirred up in this way, in the, in the protest, um, can be mourned. If we think um, of the powerful example of Black Lives Matter, um, this was a moment um, when the crowd was able to produce these new political symbols and to um, um, enable us uh, to come together um, into processing, into beginning to grapple with um, colonial violence, um, with um, um, elements that were unseen before. With my research, I try to understand how countries can withstand shocks. And basically that means how countries can be resilient to disasters. I work with communities, I work with national governments, and I work with local authorities in my research to try to determine how to build community strength, particularly the strength of vulnerable peoples. Think about a disaster that you see that takes place in California, where nobody dies, lots of economic damage happens, it's a huge earthquake. And then take a smaller earthquake in Nepal, for example. There's not a lot of economic damage, but thousands of people die. A lot of people might think that the difference between those two places is the fact that Nepal doesn't have the building materials, doesn't have the construction knowledge, doesn't have the same know-how that you have in the United States to build things strong enough to protect people. But that's not true. We know that building materials and construction knowledge and engineering solutions transcend international boundaries. What we don't have in Nepal is the human and political capital to implement these solutions and to make sure that people follow them. What I mean by human and political capital is the community knowledge and understanding of how to implement solutions, how to adopt ideas that are right for you, how to adapt them to the current situation and how to implement them moving forward. And that takes political trust in your public officials. It takes a certain amount of trust in each other. It takes some accountability from the government and some transparency with how things work. And I study programs and projects that try to build that capacity in countries around the world. Without research like this, we would have a bunch of solutions over here and a bunch of people who don't know how to implement them. And all of the biological and physical and engineering solutions in the world won't save anyone if we don't know how to convince people to utilize them. So the social sciences are the answer to helping societies develop and become as wonderful as they can be. Without social science, we would have a very poor understanding of some of the most pressing issues of our day. Without the social sciences, we would not be able to empower ourselves to actually use all the different resources we have, all the different knowledges we have, all the different skills we have, in a way that is democratic, empowering, and imaginative. We all live in one big society, but there's many different groups amongst us, and social science can help us understand those group dynamics. Without the social sciences, 
we will not be able to understand the forces that shape the destiny of local communities around the world. And we can see where there are governments that don't follow the advice of social science, uh, they're directionless, uh, and they face numerous problems that are unresolvable because they refuse to listen to, to science. Without social science, I mean, the, the point is, we, we do not have one way or the other. How then do we build on our past, present, and future? If we're going to challenge convention, ask difficult questions and effect change, we first need to understand how and why societies work. Every day, all around the world, social scientists are helping us do just that.